Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Donald Trump seems poised to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord. I think this is really a, a huge opportunity for Canada. Why it's a threat to U.S. prosperity. Thunder Bay's police board under investigation after complaints of indifference to indigenous deaths. It's no foul play, the end of investigation. Plus, CBC News uncovers a scheme affecting Canadians who think their flight from Mexico is non-stop. As one of the world's leading scientists has put it, the Paris Accord is a club for countries who are part of a global effort to tackle dangerous climate change. Donald Trump has made it clear for years he neither believes in that club's very reason for existence nor does he aspire to be a member. So there was anger at today's reports he'll pull the U.S. out of the accord. But some say it may be for the best. Here's why. The treaty was negotiated and agreed to by 195 countries. 147, including Canada and the U.S., have ratified. And it was a big deal when countries like China and India got on board. But while the accord contains a voluntary agreement to reduce carbon and methane emissions, there is no legal requirement. Some believe if Trump keeps the U.S. in, he'd try to weaken the accord, be an obstructionist force, or just ignore it with no legal ramifications. Still, when one of the world's biggest polluters signals climate change is not a priority, the world reacts. Because scientists and millions of people around the world no, there will be consequences, legal or not. David Common begins our coverage in Washington. Whether Donald Trump quits the Paris Accord may not really matter. You're going to find out very soon. His weakening of emission standards for cars and an Obama-era clean energy plan already means the U.S. is likely to miss its targets. We're going to have clean coal, really clean coal. The accord is just the vehicle to tackle climate change, something the president has called a total hoax in the past. Top strategist Steve Bannon wants Trump to follow through on his campaign promise. So do many Republicans in Congress and many in his base. But daughter Ivanka wants Trump to stay in the Paris Accord, as does his secretary of state, even the head of oil giant Exxon. Hundreds of American businesses have warned failure to build a low-carbon economy puts American prosperity at risk. Emissions need to go down. Renewable energy is becoming more and more affordable, and investments are growing every year. Um, and so the U.S. will have to play catch-up in four years, and that will mean serious issues for the U.S. economy. We will reduce our carbon emissions. And for the U.S. position in the world, says the man who worked on the Paris Accord for the Obama White House. It gives China a very good entry point to start cultivating and doubling down on its relationships with a lot of other countries. China comes along and says, Donald Trump doesn't care about you. He's just said, you're on your own. The United States is not helping you on climate change. I'm hearing from a lot of people both ways. Some believe, like his in and out approach to NAFTA, this is all about negotiation. With whom would he negotiate? Our allies are absolutely apoplectic about this, you know, win by the Neanderthal wing, wing of the White House uh, in turning their backs on science. Why would they want to sit down and negotiate a better deal? What is a better deal? And besides, Trump has promised to leave, but minds can be changed. In fact, in 2009, before Paris, it was Copenhagen. Again, business leaders urged the then president to commit. That included this man, Donald J. Trump. If Trump now takes the U.S. out, it will be in the company of Syria and Nicaragua, the only other countries that have refused to be part of this global agreement. David Common, CBC News, Washington. The aim of the accord is to hold the increase in the global average temperature to below 2 degrees Celsius. But why 2? It became a sort of buzz phrase in the 1990s when several climate panels latched onto it as a way to maintain stable climate conditions. Scientists said two degrees would bring more drought, 
more intense heat waves and higher sea levels affecting global food supply. But while two degrees was seen as a focal point that could mobilize global action, critics in the scientific community call the all-or-nothing target unreachable and misleading. They advocate emissions-related goals at national and local levels that could be monitored and measured for actual effect. Stephen Harper always said the only climate plan that would work for Canada would be one that also included the United States. The Paris Accord was that deal. So if Trump pulls out, would Justin Trudeau be forced to rethink his government's position? Catherine Cullen on that. Perhaps these were the good old days when Canada was filled with optimism about finding common ground with Donald Trump. But on climate change, the split seems to be increasingly insurmountable. No one uh, government can stop the, the momentum. Canada's just going to keep marching on uh, like the rest of the world. In Paris, Canada helped lead the charge to get countries on board with the accord. Back then, it had a partner in Barack Obama. Since then, Justin Trudeau and other world leaders have tried to make the case for the Paris Accord to Trump. Trudeau hasn't publicly slammed Trump's stance. I'm not going to uh, lecture another country on what they should do, nor will I uh, have my uh, positions determined by uh, anyone outside of Canada. President, you said we need Trump. Compare that to the European Parliament. Where there were boos when they heard Trump might be pulling out. Even if Trump does abandon the accord, world leaders are indicating they won't follow suit. We are clearly convinced that this is very important, not only uh, for the planet, it's very important uh, for the future of mankind. It's hard to back down when those are the stakes. But there's also the politics. Governments have already argued cutting emissions makes economic sense and have invested their political futures in it. There's a huge economic opportunity when it comes uh, to uh, clean technologies and, and innovation. I'm talking here about tens of billions of dollars of investments in renewables, clean tech and efficiency that Alberta has now opened the door to. Though the federal NDP says talk is nice, but they want action from the Trudeau government. Don't forget, we signed Kyoto, and under the last Liberal government, we went on to have one of the worst records in the world for greenhouse gas increases. While the Conservatives are urging caution. I wouldn't overreact. Uh, Trump's threatened to pull out of different types of accords, for example, like NAFTA, and never followed through. A big plank of Justin Trudeau's plan for Canada to cut its emissions is a carbon tax. But even taking that into account, a recent government analysis says that this country is still not on track to meet its Paris commitments. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Federal aid for softwood lumber producers will be unveiled tomorrow. CBC News reported earlier this month it will be just under $1 billion, with funds for EI assistance and to help lumber companies pay for innovation. The U.S. slapped duties of up to 24% on Canadian softwood in April, arguing the industry is unfairly subsidized here, an argument it has previously lost before the World Trade Organization. Coming up, forge signatures and your investments. It can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. It can be devastation. Whistleblowers tell us how it's done. Plus, what's the use of covering the world? Our foreign correspondents answer that and more. In an instant, the city of Kabul shuddered and a city square was torn apart. The force of a blast launching sprays of shattered glass into bystanders even blocks away. It's the deadliest attack to strike the city in years, killing at least 90 people, wounding about 400. The bomb detonated in the heart of Kabul's diplomatic district perilously close to several embassies, including the Canadian one. Cameron McIntosh has more. Wailing sirens and black smoke are familiar in Kabul. But even by that tragic standard, this was big. An explosion that left dozens dead and hundreds wounded, mostly civilians in what is supposed to be one of Afghanistan's most secure areas. I was working in the office when a powerful blast occurred, says this victim. I collapsed under the desk and received injuries from shattered windows. This man says, I opened my eyes, I found myself under the desk and saw blood coming out of my shoulder. 
It happened just outside of Kabul's highly secure Green Zone, which houses the Presidential Palace and several embassies. Canada's embassy sustained significant damage, but no one was hurt. This government spokesman says a sewage truck loaded with explosives was detonated in a suicide attack. Its intended target is not clear, but it was close enough to blow out the windows of the German embassy, killing one local guard and injuring several more staff. Chancellor Angela Merkel condemned it. In Momenten wie diesen wird uns einmal mehr klar. Terrorism knows no boundaries, she said. It targets us all. The Taliban denied responsibility. ISIS has been silent. It doesn't matter. There's, there were different, similar people with different labels on. This international security expert says it's consistent with an insurgency that has quietly grown more brazen, issuing a defiant challenge to the West as the U.S. and its allies weigh a request from NATO for more troops to train Afghan forces. It makes it more likely, I would think, that the, the West and the U.S. approach is to re-securitize rather than the drawing down of troops to put more troops in. While Canada continues to have a diplomatic presence in Afghanistan, its combat role there ended six years ago. The Prime Minister has said Canadian troops will not be back to fight. However, today Justin Trudeau did tweet that Canada will continue working alongside Afghans as they rebuild and recover. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, London. This was just day two of the public hearing of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And beyond the palpable grief of victims' families, one thing has already become abundantly clear. The inquiry needs a lot more time. Margo McDermott explains why from Whitehorse. Star Drynock sings the Woman's Warrior song in honor of her mother, who was murdered in 1992 when Star was just a baby. It's my mother, Deborah. Like many here, Drynock's message is about grief and loss. I grew up an only child, often wondering why my mother was not around. We did not remember. These hearings are a delicate process. Each person is given as much time as they need to speak. Testimony moves slowly. The $53 million inquiry is already 10 months into its two-year mandate. The head of the inquiry says she'll be asking for an extension to the December 2018 deadline. I think it's pretty clear that <laughs> uh, we're going to need some more time to get our work done in the way that we need to do it. Um, it's becoming very obvious. And the inquiry is treading carefully, determined not to cause more trauma to families. Star Drynock says just being here has helped. I came out of the tent, um, I had a good cry. Now my heart, my heart feels a lot lighter and I feel, I feel at peace. Justice. It's clear the hearings are dealing with raw emotions. This morning, a young man interrupted, grabbed the microphone. He's Alex Carlick, son of Wendy Carlick, who was found murdered in Whitehorse in April. No one has been arrested yet for her murder. I see no cops around here because they never did nothing for anything that I went through. I lost everything. It's, it's this indigenous leader says everyone in the community is impacted by the violence experienced by women and girls. She and supports the inquiry's need for more time. Is a, this is a process that no one should be rushing. We need to ensure this is done properly and we need to ensure that the families are feeling that their loved ones are being honored. Inquiry staff are now looking at how much more time they might need and how much more money. The hearings wrap up here tomorrow. Families in other parts of Canada will testify in the fall. Margaret McDermott, CBC News, Whitehorse. A string of deaths involving Indigenous youth in northern Ontario prompted an extraordinary call to action today. The bodies of several young people have been found in rivers around Thunder Bay in recent years, two in the last month alone. Indigenous leaders say local police are not investigating the deaths adequately because of racism. And today they asked both the province and the RCMP for help. Jody Porter has more from Thunder Bay. First Nations volunteers say this is a must, their own patrol of the riverbanks in Thunder Bay. These waters are where two First Nations teens were found dead earlier this month. If these weren't Indigenous youth, how would we be looking at this? Seven Indigenous teens have been found dead in rivers in Thunder Bay since 2000. Police investigators have failed to determine how the kids ended up in the water. 
First Nations leaders say it's time to bring fresh eyes to the situation. The Thunder Bay police cannot fix this. They've shown that they're not able to come to any uh, conclusion other than uh, the deaths are non-suspicious and non-criminal. But not everyone agrees that the river deaths need further criminal investigation. Many locals, including the mayor, say they were all accidents, the result of First Nations kids partying down by the river. You can't babysit these children, but we need to babysit them, obviously. Uh, we need to get measures in place that keep the kids away from the rivers, first and foremost. For First Nations leaders, these kinds of comments inflame growing racial tensions in the city. I'll be blunt here. It's just a case of of finding another dead Indian who rolled in the water, a drunk Indian that rolled in the water. That is the, the feeling we get from the community in Thunder Bay. Chiefs from across northern Ontario were in Toronto today demanding the RCMP take over Indigenous death investigations in Thunder Bay. They also want the province to disband the local police services board. Today, the board's vice chair issued this statement. Systemic racism is a much broader term than just the relationship between police and Indigenous communities. A police service cannot cure systemic racism. We accept that our service has a role to play. Young people, they experiment. They might drink sometimes. All youth, not just Indigenous youth, but for some reason, it's our youth that end up dead in the river. Ontario's police watchdog was already investigating the Thunder Bay police in the wake of complaints about systemic racism. Today, the safety minister announced an additional investigation into the competency of the city's police services board. Jody Porter, CBC News, Thunder Bay. A former Ontario nurse, Elizabeth Wetlofer, is expected to plead guilty to eight counts of first-degree murder tomorrow. That's according to a family member of one of the alleged victims. Wetlofer is accused of killing eight seniors in her care over the past decade. She also faces four charges of attempted murder and two for aggravated assault. Straight ahead, an asylum seeker dies of exposure trying to reach Canada. National with Peter Mansbridge. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is the National. Well, we are a long way from our usual cozy studio tonight. It's about 3,000 kilometers that way. This is the Northwest Passage. We're in a shaft of the old syndicate coal mines here in. Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. These are unusual surroundings for the National. We're about an hour north of Fort McMurray. From Stratford, Ontario. In Delta, British Columbia. From Parliament Hill. In Saskatoon. Going live off the deck of an icebreaker in Vancouver. From Montreal, once again tonight, a city at the heart of a crisis in the cold. You worry about the ice? Yes, I do, yeah. Um, what's going to happen if it all melts, melts away? All jolly we minor men, and minor men are we. They've all worked the coal mines in Cape Breton. Now they sing to preserve the heritage and the folklore of the island's mining communities. <laughs> Canada is still here tonight, but just barely. Quebecers have voted no to sovereignty. But of course, the story the whole world is watching is the historic switch to the year 2000. This is the day that Winnipeg has been waiting for worrying about, even dreading. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge from downtown Toronto. For the most part, an eerily dark Toronto. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge inside Vatican City. Good evening from the Netherlands, Baghdad. In Tiananmen Square tonight from London. In Vimy Ridge, France. From Kandahar, Afghanistan. Here in Berlin, there's another opening in the wall tonight, number 22. When the waves crashed ashore here and they didn't have far to come, there's the beach line. Our ride today is on an Israeli Air Force Black Hawk helicopter. That is the area that the suicide bombers use to get to some of their targets. Look at this. Those are the papal apartments just over on the other side. That's where the Pope lives. As night falls, we're back on the road, moving through the streets of Kandahar, and as always, on the lookout.
Thanks for watching. Well, L.A. police are investigating what they say is vandalism at a minimum and possibly a hate crime. The apparent target, NBA superstar LeBron James. This morning, someone allegedly spray-painted the N-word across the front gate of his home. It has since been painted over. Speaking to reporters today, James hoped this will shed light on the continuing reach of racism in America. we got a long way to go. Um, you know, for, for us as a society and for us as African Americans until we, until we feel equal um, in America. And, um, you know, but my family is safe and, um, you know, that's what's, that's what's important. James was away from home at the time as he prepares for the start of the NBA Finals. Video was released this evening of Tiger Woods' arrest for driving under the influence. You know the reason I'm out with you now? No. It's because you're, you're stopped in the road. You know, it was uh, taken by the dashboard camera in the police vehicle, showing Woods getting out of his vehicle early Monday morning and going through sobriety tests. Police ask him if he was drinking. He says no, but that he had taken medication. Blood tests later confirmed that Woods had no alcohol in his system. It was bad enough when asylum seekers crossing the U.S. border into Canada lost their fingers to frostbite. Now a 57-year-old woman has lost her life. Despite warming temperatures, preliminary autopsy results suggest the woman died of hypothermia. As Karen Poles tells us, the death is prompting renewed calls to take action so no one else suffers or dies. Mavis Otute took her last steps in this farmer's field. I wouldn't recommend trying to traverse, even in the, the daytime, tra traverse this, uh, this terrain. The, at night is even worse. After getting a call about a missing person, U.S. Border Patrol officers rode out on ATVs. They searched these fields for hours for the woman originally from Ghana. She was found in a irrigation ditch or a drainage ditch here. Asylum seekers have been crossing here all winter, and there were concerns someone could die. It's surprising the first loss of life comes in the springtime, although nighttime temperatures last week were hovering just above zero. The death is prompting people on both sides of the border to call for faster changes so it doesn't happen again. I feel sad that people have to do it to come into your country this way. I think it would be a lot better if they made it uh, easier legally. Asylum seekers sometimes cross Mike Oman's yard to get to the border, and that worries him. I can see if they're trying to flee Syria, or if they're trying to uh, flee Afghanistan, but why would they risk their life to flee the U.S. to get into Canada? It doesn't make sense. Under the Safe Third Country Agreement, refugee claimants from the U.S. are turned back at Canadian ports of entry, but if they can get into the country, International Convention allows them to make a claim here. In a statement, Conservative MP Ted Falk says, Tragically, many people are being coached to cross illegally and dangerously because the current system incentivizes such crossings. The federal public safety minister disagrees. And people should not think that, uh, that some uh, back door or side door is somehow uh, a free ticket to get into the country. It is not. The reeve of the border town where most of the asylum seekers have been crossing has been saying for months the federal government isn't doing enough to close that back door. I don't think this is going to be the last incident uh, and that's what's scary about it. Mavis Otute's daughter lives in Canada. She was likely trying to get to her when she died just half a kilometer from the border. Karen Pauls, CBC News, near Noyes, Minnesota. Up next, our correspondents discuss on the value on foreign coverage and the price. You lock eyes, you know, with these little boys who were dead a few days later. They take questions and bring you inside stories from the field. Plus, a travel scheme dupes passengers and Mexican officials. Facebook watchers, um, 
National coming to you on Facebook here during the commercial break. We've got about four minutes for your questions. So let's see what you have on your mind tonight. Melissa Mason or Masson asks, Peter, how do you feel your job as national news anchor has changed over time? I, you know, the, the, the major, uh, well, when I started, I was only doing the first 22 minutes. I shared the hour with the great the one and only Barbara Frum. Um, and Barbara, as you know, uh, passed away 25 years ago this year. We went through a number of changes after that in terms of the program, but eventually we settled in on the one anchor for the hour. So it's, it's, uh, it's changed in that way. It's twice as long as it used to be. Um, but technology has changed things in a huge way uh, on the way we um, not only gather the news, but actually give you the news in the evening. Marlo Turner Ritchie asks, what was the most exciting political story you covered? I think it's a good question. I, I mean, election nights are always exciting. Um, scandals uh, it can be quite exciting. Um, leadership conventions, I think, are the most exciting. I, you know, I've done lots of them. The first was in 1975 when Ed Broadbent won the NDP leadership in Winnipeg. Uh, 83 when Mulroney won uh, the conservative leadership. 84 when Turner won. Uh, and so on and so forth. Those were all in the old style of conventioneering were extremely exciting because you never knew exactly what was going to happen and people crossed the floor and support went back and forth. This past weekend's one, the conservative leadership where Andrew Scheer won, uh, you know, it, it was pretty much a package deal. The outcome was known to the small group as soon as they started counting the ballots, uh, very early, but then they s strung it out over a period of hours over 13 ballots before the winner was announced. But even that, you got to hand it to them, even that had a degree of excitement because of the way it played out. Um, Philip Stafford asks, will Rick Mercer ever host the National? Oh, he'd love to. So would Critch. Critch keeps, you know, putting pictures out on, uh, on Twitter and Instagram saying he's the next host. Maybe he is. I don't know. Could be. Um, but I somehow doubt that either one of them will ever host the National. Uh, Heather Dumoulin asks, what effect do you think it will have on Canada if the U.S. leaves the Paris Agreement? Well, you saw that item uh, that Catherine Cullen just did. Uh, you know, Stephen Harper used to say there's no point Canada being in a climate change agreement if the Americans aren't. Um, so Paris had both Americans and Canadians in it. Now the Americans seem to be dropping out. Apparently Trump now says he will announce his final decision tomorrow afternoon. Just did that, just tweeted that a few minutes ago. Um, so will it have an impact on Canada? I would doubt very much if Canada will pull out because the Americans pull out, but I guess we'll have to see. We've got one minute left here. Um, Jasmine Lester asks, Peter, is the relationship between Indigenous people and police from your time as a journalist getting better, worse, or staying the same? That's a tough question, um, Jasmine. I'll, I'll tell you, you don't want to overgeneralize in these things because different parts of the country uh, have been reacting differently. In some areas, police and Indigenous peoples have a really good relationship. Uh, in others, not so much. Um, so, you know, it's hard to generalize on that one in terms of the overall uh, state of the uh, relationship between Indigenous and police forces across the country. There's still, I think both sides would agree, still a lot of work to do uh, to ensure that relationship is more productive than it is at the moment. Okay, coming up in five seconds, uh, block three. It's a good one. You won't want to miss it. From South Sudan to North Korea, just some of the foreign hotspots CBC News has taken you over the past year. It continues a tradition and a commitment that reaches back to the Second World War. Covering the world is expensive and often dangerous. So, why do it? Last night, a number of our foreign correspondents gathered here in Toronto for the National In Conversation to ponder that and to take questions. Please have a look. Everyone here presumably are news junkies, everyone watching, but I actually have friends who refuse to watch the news. They don't want to know about bad news, they don't want to see it, 
And unfortunately, that's not unusual. There are a lot of people like that. What would you say to people like that? All right, give us one line on why it's important to understand what's happening on the other side of the world. You know? One line, that's so yeah. mean, Peter. I'm trying. I've already used up my line. Um, <laughs> that's your line next. It's, in, it's, imp <laughs> it's important to be informed, but I would say because we're inundated from so many sources, and you can't you choose your sources carefully. You don't need to be watching 24 hours a day, but if you choose your sources carefully, because we feel the same way in this current environment too, I think, with Trump in Turkey as well. Um, sometimes I don't turn on the TV, but I'm still consuming information from reliable sources. So. Sticking your head in the sand doesn't solve the problem. Ma'am? Here's my line. <laughs> um, I was talking to an uh, evangelical pastor in Alabama um, about why Canadians would care about what happens in the United States. And the line we eventually settled on, which he said to me was, well, I guess I suppose you would want to know if your neighbor's house was on fire. Keith? trying to punctuate my sentence so the, the thing one. So it's all one. <laughs> yeah. So I think the Trump election taught us two things, colon. <laughs> <laughs> one I think is the familiar lesson that a lot of people learned that if they weren't paying attention to what was going on and they didn't get involved, that elections have consequences and the result may not have been what they wanted. But there was a lesson, and I, don't, and I think we should not be self-righteous about this. There was a lesson for us too in not following everything that was going on in the country. We missed a big part of the Trump story because we thought we were well enough informed about what was happening in America, and we just weren't. All right, uh, question here in the audience, right over here, sir. Um, can you give uh, examples of the challenges you face separating the emotional um, attachment or um, how situations tear at your heartstrings or incense you while maintaining your professionalism and objectivity? All right, great question. Uh, I'm going to ask Margaret to, to handle it because I want you to watch something that Margaret did just a couple of weeks ago in, in South Sudan uh, that had a huge impact on anyone who saw it. And we want to know the impact it had on her doing it. Uh, watch this. Each time a flight passes, they're dropping enough food to feed 1,500 people for one month. Seven passes today. But the conflict shifts from place to place like a disaffected suitor. The whole country is hurting. <coughs> this is what starvation looks like in the capital, Juba. Teresa is so critical, she needs a feeding tube, still dressed in her best for her trip to the hospital. Four-year-old Bach also has acute malnutrition and tuberculosis on top of that. There is no money for his treatment. Shriven bodies with old souls are everywhere you look, the ward overflowing. Some children on the ground outside, hovering between a beginning or an end. So how do you deal with that? Well, not well, apparently, because you look at the images and it, and it comes back to you. But that, um, it's something that I kind of grappled with early on in my career. And I've actually had to remind myself a little bit in the wake of South Sudan, because um, those kids, you know, you look them in the eye, you lock eyes, you know, with these little boys who were dead a few days later, you lock eyes with their mothers who, you know, are stricken and sometimes look ashamed because their kids... Are, are, are perishing in front of them. And um, it's very, it's difficult to, you know, they dance in my head. But that's what they're supposed to do on a certain level. And this is sort of how I deal with it anyway. I think everybody has their own ways. But that's what we're here to do. We're here to bear witness. We're there to go and see. We're there to remember them. I, I worry about having caused, you know, Bach in particular, uh, the little four-year-old boy, distress because we were big and they don't see that many white people, you know, these kids and and he was I felt like we were frightening him and, and you know, that really haunts me too but if you don't show those kids you don't know it's happening and you can't save the next kid and all of that helps when you're trying to deal with, you know, some of the stuff that you see 
No. No, Margaret's exactly right. I think the only thing that helps balance uh, what are obviously very human reactions that we have in the field to certain situations is the fact that we do get to tell the story. It, it, in a way, it's, it's an action. Yet when you see someone who's lying there, and you see someone who's um, in the most intimate moment of their life, in a sea, for example, where I saw them trying to be saved and getting onto a ship or walking across Europe, I mean, it's, it's a very... It's a very intrusive process that we're involved in. We're barging into these people's lives. And I do feel like I, I, I owe something. I owe telling those story to, a story to someone else. And so that helps me balance my own feelings about what I see on the ground. I remember one situation years ago when I was covering the... Um the tsunami in Thailand uh, after the earthquake there, and there was a Canadian team that was actually doing an autopsy on, on, on one of the bodies. And um, it's not like Canada, basically they were pulling out the bodies and they were right there and I was right there with my camera. And you smell it, you feel it, you see what's there in front of you. Um, you have to capture it because that's the only way to get some of this across. You have to capture it, of course, in a, in a certain way that's, that, that tells the story without being unnecessarily gruesome. But from my perspective, when things were sort of the toughest, the fact that I was looking through the camera, it allowed me to get just enough distance to be able to continue doing that job and telling the story when, in fact, as I say, you're watching, uh, you know, somebody's actually being t cut open in order to find out what happened. I also remember specifically when I was covering the uh, shooting in San Bernardino, um, emotions being very raw there, and you know, I happened to be invited to the home of, of the family of one of the 14 victims, Tin Nguyen. She was a 31-year-old um, public health inspector at uh, San Bernardino. Um, and you know, this is hours after the family themselves had learned that, uh, you know, that their cousin, their sister, their daughter uh, was among one of the victims. And, you know, these things, I find sometimes they don't hit you until after. Um, I almost, you know, I, I sort of almost feel like I had kind of like almost tunnel vision just to, to do the job and to do, um, to sort of honor this person um, by telling her story. Um, but I remember it wasn't until I got back to the hotel and sort of just had time to decompress um, and, and you know, that's, when, that's when you start to get emotional, when you have time to yourself. And in those types of moments, you know, I, you know, you just, I, I, I call someone I love, which is what uh, I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, I remember 9-11, um, all of us do, obviously. I've been on the air for many hours and um, finally got a break around four o'clock the morning after and uh, the little message light was blinking on, on my phone. And, you know, I checked it was my daughter. It was one of my daughters in Winnipeg. And so I called her and I said, hi, you know, what's up? And she said, just want to know I love you. So it's kind of the same thing. And for me that night, it made me connect that whole story in a way I hadn't thought of. I'd been so busy on the air, I knew, you know, obviously I, I, I knew the scope of things and how, you know, what a disaster it was and what it could possibly lead to, but I hadn't sensed the impact it was having on people everywhere, that they wanted to connect with family, wherever that family was, that it was important for them to touch base. Now, that was just a, a short excerpt from the session of, from last night, and it was the last in our series called The National In Conversation. For weeks, we've been traveling to various cities to meet our audience and discuss topics vital to you and our coverage. To take a look, go to youtube.com slash National. Click on playlists, and you can find them all. Coming up, a travel scheme called the Mexican Game. It's no fun for passengers stuck on the tarmac. This is the story of building the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Between Jasper and Red Pass, 
a start is made. All the latest weapons employed by engineers in modern pipeline construction converge on the theaters of war. The enemy, one by one, toppling to echoing cries of timber. And the steel monsters arrive. To 140 sidings from Edmonton to Vancouver, 5,000 railway flat cars bring their loads of pipes and then to their individual prearranged spots in the continuous chain. They're linked together by a complicated process that assures 100% accuracy. The pipe is 24 inches in diameter, and every inch of it must be evenly coated. And then, checked and rechecked. Then a wrapping is added, made from glass, felt, and asbestos as the men observe their finished product laid to rest. A continuous tube, liquid railway, stretching 718 miles. The big question is, of course, whether there is life on Mars, and the short answer is that it's not impossible. No one knows what Mars really looks like, but this week, streaming back from deep space is the best information in history bringing us nearer the answers concerning the origin of life, whether man is something special or a special freak. The search for life on Mars is still continuing. Data received from the Viking landers have puzzled NASA scientists, and within the past two days, they've been able to confirm that the ice caps of Mars are really frozen water, not carbon dioxide as once believed. So the chances of finding life get better with each passing day. Its past was hostile and torn by meteors. Its present is cold and barren. A colony here would seem a futile fantasy. But today's dreamers are scientists, and they do their dreaming for NASA. I think the possibility of Mars as a second home for mankind is very important for our future as a race. The students are building a prototype Martian colony called Marsville. It's on Earth, but they do understand what it will take to settle on Mars. The temperature on Mars is a lot colder than on Earth. And these students understand cooperation is the only way to get to Mars. I mean, with all the technology they have now, we could have somebody go up pretty soon. They've come from all over the world for this meeting of the International Mars Society. They've got bumper stickers. They've got a Martian flag already picked out. The one question that always comes up is this. Is it worth the many billions more to put people on the surface of the red planet rather than just machines? The Mars fans here admit the barriers are huge, but they also say we have the capability and the money to get to Mars. All we need now is the will to do it. To find out more, we need to go out into space, and space research, like politics, is the art of the possible. What we would like to do must be weighed against what we can do. Cramped quarters, bad movies, a screaming child. When it comes to air travel, it's often best to focus on the destination and forget the journey. Travelers take pains to find the shortest, most direct flights. But as Canadian passengers on some air transat flights from Mexico learned, unexpected diversions do happen. And now, a CBC News investigation has discovered those diversions weren't what they seemed. Passengers and even aviation officials were fooled. Aaron Saltzman explains. Cancun. A million and a half Canadians visit Mexico every year, drawn by the sun and the sand. Tens of thousands of them come here to the heart of the Mexican Riviera. They fly into Cancun International Airport, making it one of the busiest in the Caribbean. A number of Canadian airlines fly this lucrative route, including Air Transat. Flight 5471 goes every Sunday between Cancun and Alberta, 
Travel time non-stop is about 5 hours and 15 minutes. While it's sold as a Transat flight, it's actually operated by Flair Air, a small charter service based in Kelowna, BC. Last spring, something odd happened with some of these flights. Sunday, May 18th, barely 90 minutes after it took off, returning to Edmonton, flight 5471 was unexpectedly diverted to New Orleans. Now, a plane being diverted in flight is not all that unusual, except the same thing happened the very next week, this time to Kansas City. And then it happened again the week after that, flight 5471 again diverted, again apparently unexpectedly. In fact, there was nothing at all unexpected about these diversions. Sources tell CBC News they were planned well in advance, an elaborate deception of both aviation authorities and passengers. Those sources all asked to remain anonymous. What we do is we file the uh, flight plan starting from Cancun to Edmonton, but we do not take the enough fuel which is required to go to Edmonton. Why, when Flair was hired by Air Transat to fly from Cancun to Edmonton, would it file a flight plan it knew in advance it was not going to follow? Could it be to maintain the illusion of a non-stop flight, a flight that's more popular and more expensive for travelers? Air Transat told CBC they didn't promote these flights as non-stop, but look at these internal emails obtained by CBC News. These ones are from Captain Harold Knopp, Flair's Director of Flight Operations, to Flair pilots. In them, Knopp explains that Mexican authorities will not allow flights to Canada to stop along the way to refuel. In aviation, these are known as tech or technical stops. The problem for Flair is that unlike Air Transat's planes, Flair's 737-400s don't have the range to go all the way from Cancun to Edmonton with a full complement of passengers and cargo, according to Flair's own pilots. So in order to allow Flair's planes to land and refuel along the way, Knopf's emails reveal a detailed scheme to deceive Mexican authorities. Flair pilots were told to file an official flight plan that showed a flight from Cancun to Edmonton, and then, once airborne, preferably outside Mexican airspace, the pilots were told to request a diversion to New Orleans. We lie on the flight plan. Um, we give them a wrong route, which we are not going to follow. We give them a wrong information of our destination. And uh, we do not take enough fuel to fly the flight plan as per the requirement. Flight documents filed by Flair and given to the pilots instruct them to make sure they don't load the amount of fuel filed on what is referred to as the bogus plan. The documents which we've obtained also show the weight on board this flight was significantly understated on the flight plan. Sources tell CBC this scheme is referred to inside Flair as the Mexican game. But not all the players know the game is being played. Knopf's emails explain passengers aren't to be told prior to boarding that their flight is going to be diverted. They won't find that out until after the plane is in the air. In fact, the pilots are told exactly what to say in the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, it says, I would like to inform that we will be required to land in New Orleans to take on additional fuel. We apologize for this delay and inconvenience. Knopp warns the pilots not to stray from that script. Air Transat, Knopp writes, has advised us that this method has worked successfully and without any issues with previous operators. That suggests Air Transat not only knew about this, they actively encouraged the practice. In fact, an email from Maurizio Diaz, Air Transat's manager of commercial operations, actually spells it out. We always need to file a direct flight Cancun to Edmonton. Never file Cancun, New Orleans, Edmonton because it will be refused by Mexican authorities. When the flight is airborne from Cancun, you can plan the technical stop in New Orleans and advise air traffic control. If you have any questions, please let us know. Knopp adds in his email, there was no negative passenger reaction in these situations. Some posts on travel forums by people claiming to be Flair passengers complained about this happening with other Flair flights to Mexico. 
It was advertised as non-stop from my travel agent, one person wrote about a flare flight from Kelowna to Cancun. The crew on board described it as non-stop and made a point of telling the entire plane they normally made it without the stop. The crew said the stopovers were due to headwinds, runway length, and passenger load. We asked Flair about the Mexican game. Flair told us to talk to Air Transat. In a series of emails, Air Transat told us for the three flights from Cancun to Edmonton in the spring of 2016, operational constraints forced us to schedule a refueling stop during the flight. Passengers were informed of this on their electronic travel documents. Transat also told us refueling stops were not planned for any of the other flights. In all the cases when a scheduled or unscheduled technical stop had to be added, the passengers were informed. Mexican authorities were also notified of a change in our flight route. Such situations were relatively rare during the winter season. But from January 28th until April 8th, we found 11 straight Air Transat return flights from Cancun that failed to make it back to their original departure city of Kelowna without a stop. Nine of those flights landed in Regina. All of them were operated by Flair. Air Transat would not say whether passengers were informed in advance that those flights would be stopping on the way. Air Transat also refused to answer any questions regarding pilots being told to file plans for a non-stop flight when they knew they'd be stopping. And Air Transat also refused to comment on whether it had told previous operators to do the same thing. As for what Flair called those bogus flight plans on the Mexican flights, Transport Canada says it was notified of unscheduled stops by Flair Air chartered by Air Transat. Transport Canada reviewed the occurrences and no further action was required. Here's the thing. We talked to Mexican aviation officials. They told us there is no rule that precludes a tech stop on flights from Mexico. Which means as far as Mexico is concerned, there is no reason for Air Transat and Flair to be playing the Mexican game. So why do it? Is it possible that the airlines actually didn't understand the rule and believed they weren't allowed to plan a stop en route? Or was it all just a way to fool people into buying what they thought was a non-stop ticket? Because again, non-stop tickets are more popular, easier to sell, and often cost more than flights with stops. Whatever the reason, there were passengers who thought they were buying one thing and they received another. The pilots were uncomfortable with the deception. The regulators are aware of it, but say there's nothing to be done. And in the end, it's the paying public who end up losing out. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Straight ahead, the high cost of forgery. An elderly man goes public about his huge loss from investments he says he never signed for. Time for the day's business numbers. It was a down arrows day for markets on both sides of the border. Here at home, the TSX fell 22 points. The loonie lost a sixth of a cent. In New York, the Dow dropped 20 points. The price of oil was down $1.34 a barrel. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, he was a seven-year-old Tibetan nomad when he was pronounced the 17th reincarnation of the Karmapa. His mentor is the Dalai Lama. His Holiness, the 17th Karmapa. That's on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. The amazing Alouette has outperformed anything that's been shot into space since the Russians started it with Sputnik 1. The mere fact that it's still faithfully sending back messages from the top side of the ionosphere is enough to make it remarkable. When it was launched in September of 1962, its designers figured that with luck it would operate for a year. As of right now, it's been in orbit for five years and seven months, and three of the six original batteries are still working. It was a picture that Canadian engineers had waited six years to see and for which Canadian taxpayers paid $100 million. A giant space robot with Canada's name on it and the Earth above. The remote manipulator system performing perfectly. Okay, and be advised that we're looking at a great picture. Good evening. It was a spectacular liftoff and a history-making day for Canada. The shuttle Challenger blasted off the pad at Cape Canaveral at dawn. On board, astronaut Mark Garneau, the very first Canadian in space. Uh, this 
trip into space uh, for me has turned out to be more than uh, ever I could have hoped for. It's a great honor for me to uh, represent Canada in space. Three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. Liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery and the first International Microgravity Laboratory. Good evening. There's a Canadian in the heavens tonight, Roberta Bonder, going around in circles and entirely happy about it. Canada's second astronaut in space. She's orbiting planet Earth about 300 kilometers straight up. She left from this space center this morning, 59 minutes later than scheduled, but after a lifetime of anticipation, those minutes probably won't mean very much in the long run. Incredible view. A crucial spacewalk took place in the skies above us early today, and Canadian astronaut Julie Payette was in charge. Payette coordinated the mission from onboard the space shuttle Discovery. History was made high in the sky today. For the very first time, a Canadian walked in space. Early this morning, astronaut Chris Hadfield began installing Canadarm2, and with it, launched a new era for the International Space Station. With, uh, with great humility and pleasure, I accept command of the International Space Station. Get back soon. The National. The National. Tonight. A British Columbia man is going public about an investment document he says was falsified by his own financial consultant. Former bank staff are speaking out too, telling us that forgery is more common than you'd think. Erica Johnson has more. That shows right there. 97-year-old Harold Blaine says he told a financial consultant at an investment firm to put his retirement savings, more than $400,000, into GICs, a safe investment. She said it was all in guaranteed investments and we had nothing to worry about. Instead, he says, she doctored a document and put his savings into risky investments that tanked but earned her big commissions. It's not right to cheat old people out of their money. Go Public has heard from employees in the financial industry who say doctoring documents and forging signatures is more common than you'd think. A CIBC financial services representative who quit last year says her manager showed her how to forge customers' initials to sign them up for credit card insurance, earn sales revenue, then cancel it. She admits she forged signatures for a colleague, adding insurance to loans, and estimates 85% of sales staff at that branch were doctoring documents. CBC is concealing her identity. You feel pretty awful knowing that you could have caused some serious harm to them, all in the name of profit for a bank. A financial advisor who recently left TD Bank says his manager showed him how to falsify documents too. They would demonstrate it on a blank piece of paper and then they would say this is what I would do, but they would never say this is what you should do. Both CIBC and TD tell Go Public the allegations are grounds for immediate dismissal. The Mutual Fund Dealers Association of Canada opened 130 investigations last year involving falsifying signatures, more than double the previous year and almost triple the year before that. In a report released today calling attention to the issue of forgery, the Small Investor Protection Association says there is absolutely no doubt that falsification of documents is widespread. Parliamentary hearings into sales practices inside the big banks begin next week. Investor advocates say they want government to look into the investment industry too, an industry that's largely self-regulated. Erica Johnson, CPC News, Vancouver. Erica and the Go Public team get their ideas from you, our viewers. So if you want to get in touch, send an email to gopublic at cbcnews.ca. 
That's The National this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.